Um, well, thank you very much. I feel very happy and privileged to be here. And uh, my research is closely related to the thematic program on uh, variational geometry this year. And my talk is for people not in the program. So I'll try to, to be very, very elementary. And uh, like for many people in the program, uh, my research is closely related to minimal surfaces. So let me start by explaining what they are. Uh, minimal surfaces of dimension one are called geodesics, and they are the generalization of a straight line. So if you live uh, in a Riemannian manifold and uh, you shoot a bullet, it's going to fly along a geodesic. <coughs> and uh, uh, the defining property of what it means to be a geodesic is if you take some vector field and you try to vary your uh, geodesic along that vector field, then the derivative of the length for this variation will be 0. Or a different, maybe somewhat simpler defining property is that if you take a small disk or a small ball in your manifold and you look at the intersection of your curve with the boundary of that ball, and you look all competitor curves connecting these two points, then the geodesic will, sh will have the shortest length among all paths connecting these two points when the disk is sufficiently, when the ball is sufficiently small. Of course, globally, it doesn't have to be the case. If you think of the round two-dimensional sphere and you think of the equator, then the path between this point and that point along the equator will not be length minimizing, but it still will be a geodesic. Only on the small scale, the geodesics are area minimizing. And similarly, for a general dimension, we can think of surfaces with this property that if you vary them with some one parameter family of vector fields, then their volume will have derivative 0. And it is also true that smooth surfaces will have the property that if you look at a small ball, then a smooth minimal surface will have the smallest area among all surfaces in that ball with that boundary. Now, when you shoot a bullet, it may fly around your manifold and never come back, or it may eventually, like on the two-sphere, come back with the same tangent vector, and its motion will become periodic. And in this case, we say that we obtained a closed geodesic, a map from a closed curve, which is a geodesic. And similarly, we will think of maps of closed surfaces, which are minimal surfaces. And we will be interested in, constru in constructing objects like that. So I'll talk about construction of minimal surfaces. And there are different ways of constructing them. I'll specifically talk about uh, min-max constructions. In the beginning of 20th century, Poincaré posed the problem of constructing closed geodesics on simply connected spaces like a two-sphere. And Birkhoff had the following idea of how to construct a closed, a closed geodesic for any metric on S2. He considered a family of closed curves which start at a point and then contract to a point on the other side. And then he developed a process for shortening all curves in this family simultaneously and continuously. And so the curves that are very close to this point will contract to that point as you run the process. And the curves that are very close to that point will contract to that point as you run the process. But there will be some curve in between which will not know whether to go up or down. And so it will get straighter and straighter and straighter and will converge to a geodesic. Right. So there is a different way of seeing this picture. 
Imagine that we are looking at the space of closed curves. And we have a function defined on that space, which will be length. And we will picture it like a height function. And this space will have some non-trivial topology. It will have some non not now homologous cycles. So each point here in this space represent a represents a closed curve in our manifold. And now we can try, we can take a non-trivial family, a loop of curves, and now we can try to make the uh, length of all curves in this family as small as possible to push it down. And what we will see is that this family, because it is non-trivial, will get stuck on a critical point. So this will be a critical value of this function. In other words, if you have some non-trivial element in the homology of your space, let's call it lambda, then what you can do is you can, can define w of lambda or width of lambda as the smallest possible maximum in all families which correspond to that homology class. So we take the supremum, the maximum, over the length of all curves in the family. And then we take the infimum, the minimum, over all families which represent that class. And this is why Amgen Pitt's min max theory is called min max theory. <laughs> Minimum and max. Right. So, so this is the theory, which is called Morse theory for uh, the space of closed curves. And uh, we have an expert in the audience for, for this theory, uh, Nancy Hingston. And it's a wonderful reach theory. And uh, I'd like to just point out one subtlety here uh, that it would seem that because we have a lot of different homology, uh, homology classes in the space of closed curves, that you would get a lot of critical values. And the critical values are length of closed geodesics. And because we have a lot of different length of closed geodesics, we would want to say that we actually have a lot of different geodesics. But unfortunately, it may happen that different uh, critical values correspond to the same closed geodesic traversed many times. So we have an issue of multiplicity here. And it was only in the 90s that through combined uh, results of uh, uh, Franks, Bangert, and Hingston, that it was proved that on S2, there are infinitely many distinct uh, okay, closed geodesics. Sorry? Right, right. It's a very subtle, subtle subject where uh, many claims. Yes, it's a subtle subject. Now, what we want to do is we want to replace the space of closed curves with space of submanifolds, surfaces, and attempt to do a Morse theory or something of this kind on the space to produce minimal surfaces. And if we do it for uh, for two-dimensional surfaces and look at the map for two-dimensional surfaces, there's a rich theory and uh, Tristan de Rier, who's going to be here in the second semester as a specialist in the field. But if you want to uh, produce embedded surfaces instead of immersed minimal surfaces, and especially if you want to do in higher dimensions, then there are uh, uh, many problems that our objects can concentrate to, can, can converge to, to uh, uh, mm, uh, surfaces with different topology. And so we are forced to consider the space of surfaces with varying topology. And so what's been especially successful was considering the space of flat cycles. And here our functional will be the volume functional, where as we move from point to point, your topology may allow, is allowed to change. And the notion of distance is that to polyhedral 
uh, Lipschitz cycles are considered close to each other if their difference bounds a chain of small volume. And you can imagine that even the space before was not a finite dimensional space, but at least it had some uh, structure of a smooth manifold. And this space is much worse. It doesn't have anything like a smooth structure. And also the functional that we are considering, the mass functional, the volume functional, is not even continuous in that space, let aside differentiable. So you can imagine that there are many, many difficulties in developing the theory that will allow construction of minimal surfaces. Nonetheless, the main intuition that as you're pulling from one side and you're pulling from the other side, the thing in between is forced to become as small as possible and is pushed to becoming a minimal hypersurface, minimal surface, this intuition guided mathematicians in the second half of the uh, 20th century and through the combined efforts of Almgren and Pitts and uh, Richard Shane, who's uh, here in the program uh, uh, this semester, and uh, Leon Simon, it was possible eventually to prove, to realize this program in the case of co-dimension one cycles, hypersurfaces, and to show that for each uh, homology class in the space of cycles, you will be able to do this mean max and produce a minimal hypersurface. And in recent years, this theory has witnessed a lot of dramatic developments and a lot of wonderful results um, due to the push of Fernando Marquez and Andre Neves and uh, many developments that they uh, pioneered. Um, but I'm interested in the part of the theory where you study the space of flat cycles and you try to understand how you can construct these homology classes so that they have some special properties. For instance, how can you bound uh, the volumes of cycles in these families? And that will reflect in certain bounds for the volumes of minimal surfaces. How can you construct them with certain control on their topology? Or how you can construct a family of cycles so that mm, they don't intersect each other too much at different times? And what sort of an effect that would have on the minimal surface that you produce? Mm -hmm.